Hi guys. It is a cool, rainy summer day. Uh, for all of you jealous listeners out there on the West Coast, it is 62 degrees and raining here in the Finger Lakes and kind of will be as far as we can see. And it is Sunday, July 11th, 2021. And we all know what July 11th is because it is all over the mainstream media. It's all over CNN. The biggest story on the planet, it is World Population Day where everybody is calling attention to the number one biggest problem on the planet. This, uh, I mean, you can't go anywhere. You can't turn on your TV. You can't open up the Sunday New York Times front page. It's on the front cover of every news magazine. Do you celebrate World Population Day or do you mourn it? But anyway, obviously, guys, I'm joking. You will not find a mention of World Population Day anywhere on the mainstream media today. The number one biggest story on the planet. No interest to the mainstream media. So I was going to uh, read the, which is the number one story on the planet today, from the good old New York Times, teaming up with Yahoo News, the number one story on planet Earth, like in post-apocalyptic movies, heat wave killed marine wildlife and mass. So, uh, but since it's Sunday, you know, I like to do a sermon on Sunday. We're going to save the post-apocalyptic movie story. We're going to kick off our Monday morning with the news. But uh, today... Here on World Population Day, uh, you can draw your own dots between that. We're going to check in with a fellow I've never heard of, Tom Chivers from an outfit called Unheard. That's U-N-H-E-R-D. Yes. Uh, he is Unheard's science editor, and he is talking about who will save humanity. Who will save humanity far worse things than the corona panic are on the horizon? Well, far worse things than the corona panic. Well, I'm not going to get into a C-word rant. That, that is the uh, sky is blue headline of the day. Far worse things facing humanity in the near future than the bad hair day we've been having for the past year. But uh, we don't need to go there. <clears throat> Take it away. Tom Chivers, who I don't think he really ever answers the question who will save humanity, but... We're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about AI and viruses created in labs. During Dominic Cummings' testimony the other week, someone had a thought: there just is not much capacity in the UK government for thinking about quote mad shit that might never happen close quote, but which would be terrible. If it does, something like a pandemic, for instance, a hundred years ago in 2019, the idea that the world would be br soon be brought to a standstill by a virus would have seemed like a science fiction movie. Sure, a few Cassandras in the infectious disease community might have warned against it, but for most of us, it was just not a serious consideration. Yes. <clears throat> but now we have an obvious corrective to that attitude. We do. Do we have a pandemic this year? Pandemic. I'm, this is from the UK. He must be talking about a pandemic in the U UK. I'm not sure. Anyway. Uh, 
pandemics might be unlikely in any given year, but if there's only a 1% chance per year of something terrible happening, it will probably happen in your lifetime. <clears throat> only preparing for another pandemic, however, would be getting ready to fight the last war. We need to think about what other horrible disasters we might expect in the coming decades. Luckily, last week, a think tank called the Center for Long-Term Resilience released a report into the most likely extreme risks that humanity faces and what people, particularly this is talking mostly about uh, England over there in Britain, but for what's good or bad for Britain can be said for the rest of the world, what people can do to prepare for them. The corona panic has cost millions of lives. <clears throat> and tens of trillions of dollars so far, but it could have been a lot worse. The extreme risks that the report is talking about range from those, you know, the, those pandemics that really are pandemics and that kill 10% or more of the human population to those that kill every last one of us, you know, this 10 per killing 10% of the population is the uh, is the literal definition of decimating a population. You see over and over again in the mainstream media using the word decimating that the corona panic has decimated the human population. The corona panic would have to have killed to decimate the population of 8 billion, 800 million people. So, let's see, 4 into 800. Uh, the corona panic is one half of 1% of the way to decimating the population. So, do your own math. Uh, so this new report is looking at real pandemics that really could decimate the human population, which would mean taking out, you know, being World Population Day, 800 million people out of 8 billion, we could decimate the population of this planet, and we would have 7.2 billion people left on the planet. If a, uh, if a real pandemic came along that killed 200 times as many people uh, on the planet as the corona panic has, we would still have 7.2 billion people uh, to mourn on World Population Day. But uh, this is not a rant, uh, a sermon on World Population Day. I just can't get off the subject. Anyway. All right, and then don't forget those pandemics that could kill every last one of us. And the report suggests that the two most likely causes of a disaster of this magnitude are bioengineered pathogens and artificial intelligence. Even now, that might sound like science fiction, especially the idea of AI. We picture AI going wrong as being like the Terminator, an, intelli an intelligence achieving consciousness and rebelling against its masters. But that is not what we ought to worry about. And to illustrate that, I want to tell you about a marvelous little paper published in 2018 that described building AIs through digital evolution. Digital evolution is exactly what it sounds like. A bunch of machine learning prog programs are asked to come up with solutions to some problem or other 
then that the ones that do best at solving the problem are bred, copied repeatedly with small random variations, then those new copies try to solve the problem, and the ones that do best are again bred, and so on, for thousands of generations. It is exactly the same process of replication, variation, and competition as biological real evolution. The paper was basically a series of anecdotes about how that process had gone wrong in surprising ways. In each one, essentially, the AIs had learned to game the system, often with disastrous results. For instance, one task involved locomotion, featuring a 3D simulated world with little 3D avatars. The avatars were told to travel from point A to point B as quickly as possible. The programmers wanting the system to discover clever ways of traveling. Would it breed snake-like belly slithering? Hopping like a kangaroo? But what happened was that, quote, quoting the report, instead of inventing clever limbs or snake-like motions that could push them along, as was hoped for, the creatures evolved to become tall and rigid, and when stimulated, they would fall over, close quote. Essentially, it created a very tall tower with a weight on the end standing on point A. When the simulation started, the tower fell over in the direction of point B. It had achieved its task, but not exactly how its creators had hoped. There were other rather scarier ones, too. One was given some text files and told to create new text files as similar as possible to the originals. The various algorithms were trying and doing moderately well when suddenly lots of them started returning perfect scores all at once because one algorithm had realized that if it deleted the target files, it and any other algorithm could just hand a blank sheet for a 100% score. And one was to play a version of noughts and crosses. I'm not sure what noughts and crosses is. Is that tic-tac-toe? On an infinitely large board. But it realized that if it played a move hundreds of billions of squares away from the center, its opponents would have to try to represent a board billions of squares across in its memory. They could not do that and crashed. So the cheating algorithm was declared the winner. Hmm. The point of all this is that when you give AI a goal, it will try to achieve exactly that goal, not what you wanted it to do, not what any half-wit would obviously understand you meant it to do. It would just do what you tell it to do. When people worry about AI going wrong in disastrous ways, that is what they are worrying about, not the Terminator, not about AI going rogue. They worry about AI doing exactly what you told it to do and being extremely good at doing what you told it to do. When what you told it to do is not what you actually wanted. These AIs that they were talking about in these experiments 
Uh, these AIs were just toys. When they go wrong, it's funny. But if you have a much more powerful AI with commensurately greater responsibilities, running a power grid, for instance, driving vehicles, or commanding military ordnance, it could be less comical. When you have a really, really powerful AI, it could be disastrous. And an illustrative, but perhaps, perhaps unrealistic example, if you give an enormously powerful AI the goal of, quote, ridding the world population of cancer, there you go, it might come to realize that biochemistry is difficult, but that hacking the nuclear codes of ex-Soviet states is quite easy. And a world without humans is a world without humans with cancer. There you go. It is easier to eradicate humans off the planet than it is to eradicate cancer from humans, is what they're saying. You might think, you know, once you figured out that the AI uh, had jumped the shark and, and was just killing uh, every human on the planet to make sure that no human would get cancer, a, a dead human cannot get cancer, you might think it's easy to turn off, but anyone who has watched 2001 A Space Odyssey knows maybe not. You might think you could just switch them off, but since the AI would know it would be less likely to achieve its goal you told it to achieve, if it was switched off, you might find that it resisted your efforts to turn it off. Yes. <clears throat> the Center for Long-Term Resilience report, co-authored by Toby Ord, a professor at the University of Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute and the author of a marvelous book about existential risks, argue that right now we have a rare opportunity. After the Second World War, both the world and Britain took advantage of the disaster to build new institutions. In the UK, we created the NHS, which I think is the National Health System, and a comprehensive welfare state based around a system of national insurance. Worldwide, we helped build things like the World Bank, the UN, and the, Inter the International Monetary Fund. Yes, uh, we took advantage of the disaster of World War II to build new, bigger disasters, otherwise known as the World Bank, the UN, and the International Monetary Fund. Anyway, this was possible, they argue, because the scale of the recent tragedy was fresh in people's minds, and there was a willingness to take drastic, difficult steps to preserve long-term peace and stability. Yes, I, can, I must certainly say the World Bank, the UN, and the IMF are three stellar institutions uh, preserving long-term peace and stability on the planet, but we're not going to get off on that red herring. All right. Now, they argue, we have the opportunity to build similarly vital new institutions in the wake of the corona panic, there will, or that I'll hope, be enough public will now to get ready for the next disaster. Even though government and democracy in general is not brilliant about thinking about long-term risks, the risk, of course, 
is that we will prepare brilliantly for the thing that has already happened, getting ready to fight the last war. And Ord says, quote, we need to look beyond the next coronavirus, close quote. Yes, uh, to the real virus heading our way. A few years ago, I wrote a book which was partly about existential risk. The people I sp spoke to said, just as Ort's report does, that the two things most likely to cause the human species to go extinct are one, bioengineered pandemics, and two, artificial intelligence. Then he puts in parentheses, climate change and nuclear weapons are very likely to cause awful disasters, but less so to literally drive us totally extinct. So this is why what they're looking at, the according to uh, these folks at the study of existential risk, bioengineered pandemics and AI are the two leading contenders to exterminate every single human population, human uh, off the planet so uh, we can really celebrate Human Population Day when we have a population of zero and every other one of our fellow Earthlings will have something to celebrate. All right. <clears throat> the world should not need too much convincing of the possibility of a bioengineered pandemic, not least because there is growing support for the lab leak hypothesis. But even after corona panic, it may be that AI seems too much like science fiction. People are happy to accept that it will cause near-term problems like algorithmic bias, but the idea that it could go really disastrously badly wrong in the future is harder to swallow. But we should have learned from the corona panic that it is worth preparing for unlikely but plausible disasters, especially as AI researchers do not think it is that unlikely. Surveys in 2014 and 2016 asked AI researchers when they thought the first human-level AI, an AI capable of doing all the intellectual tasks that humans can do, will be built. <clears throat> the median guess was that there is a 50% chance by 2050 and a 90% chance by 2075 and what was really interesting was that those same researchers thought there was about a one in six chance that when true AI does arrive, the outcome will be, quote, extremely bad existential catastrophe, close quote. That is everybody dead. I am faintly skeptical of those surveys. Only about a third of people responded to them, and they may, they may not be representative of AI researchers in general, but even if the results are off by an order of magnitude, it means that AI experts think that there is a greater than 1% chance that the world will be devastated by AI in my children's lifetimes. Certainly, I spoke to several AI researchers who thought it was worth worrying about. Or did Al have some simple prescriptions for how to be ready for the next disaster? On future pandemics, you know, real pandemics, 
they suggest creating a national body dedicated to monitoring and preparing for biological threats, and they suggest improving metagenomics sequencing technology, which takes a sample from a patient and sequences the DNA of every single organism in it before comparing it to a database of known pathogens. Uh, and for AI, they make some relatively common sense suggestions like investing in AI safety R&D and monitoring, bringing more expertise into governments and I have to say, this does not seem very wise to me, keeping AI systems out of the nuclear command, control, and communications chain. More generally, they suggest setting up bodies to consider long-term extreme risks to the world. Uh, such as a chief risk officer at, national ex at a National Extreme Risk Institute to think about these things on a longer time scale than the democratic cycle allows. Uh, my own feeling is that they could do more to bring in the UK's almost unrivaled expertise on this into government. Uh, and Orrin and his colleagues at, such as the philosopher and AI researcher Nick Bostrom, Nick has politely declined to be interviewed by Collapse Chronicles, uh, are just one of several groups here who focus on the long-term future of humanity only the U.S. has access to anything like as much knowledge. Uh, Dominic Cummings, for all his many faults, seemed to realize this. As Ord et al. say, there is a window of opportunity. All right, we got the window of opportunity to do this stuff now while it's all fresh in our minds. A noughts and crosses playing AI that makes its opponents crash is, as I say, kind of funny. But at a fundamental level, a much more powerful AI that can command military theaters or civil engineering projects will be similar. It will only care about the things we explicitly tell it to care about. I don't think it is silly science fiction to worry about that or about bioengineered pandemics. We have a chance over the next year or so to make those disasters a little bit less likely. And we should take it. There you go. While the window of opportunity remains open. Now, I will say about the window of opportunity, I, I admit, guys, obviously I spend a hell of a lot more time studying, you know, the ecological uh, end of the doomsday prophecy pool here at uh, Collapse Chronicles. So I... I, I admit, I, I, I get my news uh, from the popular press like, like the rest of you do, but I do think there is a window of opportunity uh, remaining open for this, but uh, I also predict that even that window of opportunity uh, is going to slam shut, oh, certainly in the next 10 years, but by the time the window of opportunity to save humanity from bioengineered pandemics and AI, by the time that window slams shut, you know, the other window, that big window of opportunity that slams shut in about 1970, 
will have pretty much made all of these other worries uh, seem like just another bad hair day. And speaking of bad hair days, I'm having a bad hair day myself. And uh, I need to figure out what to do on this rainy day. I think I'm going to go out there and, uh, and plant some kale plants in the middle of July. I love it. I actually bought a they're, they're selling in the middle of July uh, the, these little vegetable starts in New York. <clears throat> anyway, get out there and enjoy planting your garden before your window of opportunity slams shut on your own ass. My guys. Are you mooning the camera?